Okay, good morning, and thank you for being here so early, and um, I'm very happy to be here to talk about my favorite thing, which is biomaterials that you use to manufacture intraocular lenses and the complications related to intraocular lenses. So as you know, we have a laboratory on the fourth floor that I co-direct with Nick Mamelis, and we have these fellows this year. One of them is here, the other one should be here. <laughs> So Nathan and Joshua, and we have Bill and Tilan as students volunteering in the lab. So uh, I would like to start by giving you just an overview of the materials that we use for the current uh, intraocular lenses. So basically, you can divide materials for intraocular lenses into two major classes, and you have high, uh, acrylic and silicon materials. The acrylic lenses can be rigid lenses made of PMMA, or they can be foldable acrylic lenses. And traditionally, we divide those foldable acrylic lenses into hydrophilic and hydrophobic according to the water content. And all of the silicone materials, they are actually foldable lenses. So um, here you have some examples of the rigid acrylic lenses, so PMMA lenses. They are mostly used still in developing countries, but you have posterior chamber lenses that you put in the capsular bag or in the sulcus. You have anterior chamber lenses made of PMMA. You also have iris fixated intraocular lenses that are made of PMMA. So now for the foldable acrylics, let us start with the hydrophilic acrylic materials. They are also known as hydrogel materials. And although we have a general formula to show how they are made, actually each hydrophilic acrylic lens is made of a slightly different copolymer of hydrophilic acrylic material. So they have different characteristics. For example, the water content, may range from 18% to 38%. There are some others that are even higher than that. The refractive index may range from 1.46 to 1.48. So again, each hydrophilic acrylic lens in the market is not made of the same material. There are different copolymers in the market. So just to give you an idea, the hydrophilic acrylic lenses are not very popular in the United States. However, they are very popular in markets such as Europe, for example. And in Europe, you are going to have a lot of variety of designs that are used to make these hydrophilic acrylic uh, lenses. Those three here, actually the center flex, hydroview and memory lens, they were very available in the United States. The center flex by Rayner is still is available in the United States. We'll talk about the other two a little bit more later. But again, just to show you the huge variety of designs that are available in Europe made with these hydrogel or hydrophilic acrylic materials. They are popular there, they are actually less expensive than hydrophobic acrylic lenses. So in terms of hydrophilic acrylic lenses, maybe you heard about this columnar material. So this is a material uh, that is made by STAR, the company STAR here in the United States. And it's basically a hydrophilic acrylic lens with a water content of 34% uh, with a porcine collagen. And this is actually used for the manufacture of intraocular lenses for cataract surgery in plate designs and uh, uh, three-piece designs. But it's also used for the manufacture of the implantable contact lens, which is a fake posterior chamber lens. Maybe you saw some surgeries here at the Moran. I know that's used here. And what's the principle of this columnar material? So by having that collagen, they state that the material is more biologically quiet because the collagen has an affinity for the protein fibronectin that you see in the anterior chamber after IOL implantation. And because there will be a monolayer of fibronectin on the surface of the IOL, this is going to inhibit further protein deposition. And then it's like the IOL is not recognized as a foreign body. So in any way, that's their principle. There are some studies showing that the biocompatibility of this material is very good in, term of, in terms of inflammatory reaction that's really very low after implantation. 
Now let us move to the hydrophobic acrylic materials. And again, the same thing. You may have some general formulas to show these materials, but each hydrophobic acrylic lens in the market is actually a very different lens. So for example, this is the Acrisoft material, has a refractive index of 1.55, one of, one of the highest, which means for a given dioptric power, that would be the thinnest intraocular lens. And you see that the water content of this hydrophobic acrylic material is usually very low. It's less than 0.5%. And later I'll show you that this is changing nowadays. So again, this is the Acrosoft material by Alcon. Here you have the sensor material. That's a material that's actually used in the Technis lens nowadays by AMO. <coughs> Again, you see the refractive index, and you see that the water content is usually much lower than the hydrophilic acrylic materials. So in what this is changing? There are other hydrophobic acrylic lenses in the market with, with very low water content, but later we'll discuss about a problem named glistenings in the hydrophobic acrylic materials. And there are new materials in the market, for example, this one. This was developed by AVS but it was licensed by Bausch and & Lomb, and that's the material you have in the eternity intraocular lens, which is becoming popular here in this country too. And it's a hydrophobic acrylic material with a water content that's almost 4%. So such material prevents glistening formation. That's the only IOL that the FDA actually approved as being a glistening-free intraocular lens. Later we'll discuss about the glistenings, but there are tests in the laboratory that we can do to really exaggerate glistenings formation, and we cannot see glistenings with this material. So the fact that you have a higher water content actually helps in that. Another thing that is changing is that traditionally you had the hydrophilic acrylic lenses packaged in a, a vial with solution, so they are wet packet. And the hydrophobic acrylic lenses would always be dry packet because the water content is so low. However, this lens here is a hydrophobic acrylic lens, has a slightly higher water content, and is packaged in water. Therefore, nowadays, you, you don't have these traditional things anymore. But why we know that this is a hydrophobic acrylic lenses? So what gives... Um, hydrophobic character or hydrophilic is the characteristic of the surface. So there are some tests, like for example, you put a drop of water on the surface and the way the water sits on the surface forms an angle. By measuring that angle, we know if it's hydrophobic or hydrophilic. And that's what tells us that's hydrophobic material, even though the water content of the material is a bit higher. Okay, yeah, go ahead. So, So let us get, uh, get this question later when you get to the glistenings because maybe with the slides I'll, I'll answer this question fully, okay? So let us move there. Now the second class of uh, foldable intraocular lenses is the silicone lenses. However, again the same thing. Not all silicone lenses are the same. There are different generations of silicone materials and the earlier generation has a very low uh, refractive index, so those lenses were much thicker than the current more modern silicone lenses with a much higher refractive index, so they are much thinner lenses. So basically what you have to understand is that within each class, you don't have just one material. Each lens is really made of different copolymers of that class. So I would like to talk a little bit about this special silicone lens, the light adjustable lens. We worked with this lens a lot for like 10 years and it was just approved uh, by the FDA. So you may be seeing here um, this lens. And it's a special silicone lens because it has a special uh, components within it that's, uh, that are named macromers. So they are not fully polymerized. So you implant the lens and then you measure the refractive power after IOL implantation. And if you're not happy, if you have a refractive surprise or if you want to adjust it, you actually shine uh, near UV light on that lens. And when you do that, for example, if you shine in the center, 
the macromers, they are not polymerized, they are going to polymerize, so then the others are going to move to the center and you see that there is a change in the shape of the optic, so there is a change in the power of the lens. So that's very interesting because you can do a non-invasive adjustment of the power of the lens after surgery. So again, it was just approved in, uh, by the FDA, but it is a silicone lens. It has to be that specific lens. Nowadays, you may know that we are working with another project that we use the femtosecond laser to change the power of the lens, but that lens does not need to be a specific lens. It can be any lens. So now that this light adjustable lens is approved, we may have something that is actually better. But in any way, you need to know about this material. And what else you have in the uh, material of the intraocular lens? You do not just have the main polymer. You also have ultraviolet absorber. Pretty much all intraocular lenses, with few exceptions, they have those. They are generally benzophenones or benzotriazoles. So these molecules are going to protect against ultraviolet radiation in this wavelength because the natural crystalline lens does that. So as soon as you do cataract surgery and you remove the natural crystalline lens, you have to have an intraocular lens that provides the same type of protection. That's why they are there. But you also have some lenses with special blockers. You probably all saw some intraocular lenses that are actually yellow, and there are some in the market that are actually violet or orange. In Europe, there are some orange ones. And basically, the principle of that is that the natural crystalline lens yellows with age, and this protects the retina against blue light. So the companies thought, okay, maybe it's a good idea to provide the same type of protection within the intraocular lens. So beside the UV protection, these lenses have a dye they are going to prevent, to block the blue light. So you see these lenses in the market. And not available in the United States, but we actually work in this very interesting project, and this lens is available in different markets. It is a photochromic intraocular lens. So this is a hydrophobic acrylic lens with a special property that, for example, the patient is implanted with the lens. If the patient is here, is dark, the lens is colorless inside of the eye of the patient. But then as soon as the patient goes outside and there is sunlight, that lens inside of the eye of the patient very fast turns yellow, providing a blue light protection, and vice versa. So that was a very interesting project. Unfortunately, it's not available here in the United States. You have some sunglasses that have the same property. Okay, so now you have an idea about overall intraocular lenses and materials, so basically uh, acrylics or silicones, but within each class, you do not have the same exact material for each lens. So now let us talk about some complications of intraocular lenses, and you are going to see that some complications are really mostly related to a specific class of intraocular lens. So in this paper, we summarize everything, and we are going to start to talk about complications related to hydrophilic acrylic lenses or hydrogel. So there was this complication that was very interesting. This is not a lens that's available in the United States. It's available in Brazil and South America. And if you remember, the majority of hydrophilic acrylic lenses will have a water content between 18 and 38%. This one has a water content of over 70%. So this lens is implanted rigid when it's very small and it goes to through a very small incision without any need of folding. Once in the capsular bag, it starts to increase, expand as a sponge. So it's a very interesting trochlear lenses. But then one of my colleagues there implanted these lenses in some cases where he used tripan blue because he was doing surgery on white cataracts. So the tripan blue, you stain the anterior capsule and enhance visualization for the rexes and everything. And then the next day, the lens was blue inside of the eye. It was slightly the center, and the patient was seeing uh, hollows, blue hollows everywhere. So basically, you have here the lens, the dimensions when you insert the lens, and then when it's fully hydrated, you see the water content is extremely high. And we did some tests, and what happens is that even if you dilate the tri if you dilute the tripan blue a lot, 
if you have any residual capsular dye inside of the capsular bag, that lens will be able to absorb and then when it expands, it expands and it turns blue. So that's what happened with his case. So he had a residual tripan blue there and then the lens became blue inside of the eye of the patient and there is no way to remove that from the lens. So after that complication, many studies were done to evaluate the interaction of all kinds of intraocular lens, all kinds of intraocular lens materials with different capsular dyes that are available in the market. And then the authors arrived to the conclusion that it really doesn't happen very frequently. There is a possibility this could happen with hydrophilic acrylic lenses, especially if they are not fully hydrated when you put inside of the capsular bag. But if you put inside of the capsular bag after dye and the lenses were put fully hydrated, then you should not have this problem of discoloration of intraocular lenses. Now, what's the most important problem with hydrophilic acrylic lenses. So if you have a patient coming to you, you check, uh, there is a complaint that after cataract surgery, a few years later, the vision is decreased. You check the posterior capsule, there is no posterior capsule opacification, or there is a YAG laser, and the patient is still is complaining. If you look at this little lamp, you see some haze. If you know it's a hydrophilic acrylic lens, what's the first thing you ever have to think of? Okay, Joshua, I'll have to pick on you on that one. Calcification. Okay, so calcification. If the patient comes, there is such complaint, you check this little lamp, there is a haze, you check the, the patient, the lens he had, it is a hydrophilic acrylic lens and they are available in this country, you have to think about calcification. So these are the major designs in the past that had calcification. The HydroView made by Bao Shalom was available in this country. These two lenses here were not available in this country, but were manufactured in this country and sent to other countries. Oh, I had a problem that I lost my view here, so it's fine, I can use there in any way. So again, these two. Oh, oh the screen. Oh, good, thank you. <laughs> Yeah, so these two here, again, uh, were sent to other countries, and they opacified in large, large numbers, really very large numbers. So with the hydro view, you have like a granularity covering the surface of the lens. Sometimes there are some clear marks. So you can do histochemical stains for calcium. You have the Elysium red, so you can directly stain the lens with Elysium red, and the calcium deposits are going to turn red. Or you can make slice of the intraocular lens and then it's stained by the Foncosa method and the calcium deposits will stain in black as you can see here. And you can do scanning electron microscopy where you have a very high magnification of the deposits and then you select a spot and you apply a technique such as energy dispersive X-ray spectroscopy. When you apply this to this area for example, it gives you like peaks, and those peaks correlates with the composition, the elemental composition of the deposits. That's how we know that those deposits are precisely made of calcium and phosphate. So we, again, with the hydro view, it was mostly on the surface, but it was very interesting with these lanes, it was mostly within the substance of the lanes. So it's almost like the patient had a cataract again. And you see again the, the surface of the lens is here, but the von Cossa is actually positive inside of the lens. Here we have to cut the lens to show the deposits by scanning electron microscopy. And you see here the calcium and the phosphate peaks. And again, we had to, sell, uh, to section the lens to stain by a lesion red. So with this design, it was within the substance of the lens. With this design, the AquaSense, it was everywhere. It was on the surface, it was on the substance. There are huge numbers. I had a friend in Brazil who implanted hundreds, 100 of these lenses and 100% of them calcified. He had like lawsuits like crazy. He almost had to give up his clinical practice. It was a total nightmare. So later we'll discuss about why this, is, this happens. Memory lens was available in this country. It was made by um, by um, supervision at the time. And we still receive once in a while lenses like that 
here. And Alan Crandall just another day explained a lens like that here. So you may be seeing something like that in the clinics. So if you have a patient with a memory lens complaining of decrease in visual acuity, you look at this lit lamp and you see granularity like that, you have to think about calcification. So again, you see the scanning electromicroscopy with the peaks of calcium and phosphate. That's how we definitely say it is calcification. And one of the hypotheses, and this we tested together with Bauchelon for the hydroview, is the following. So in the past, the hydroview lenses were used and they were not calcifying, and then suddenly the manufacturer changed the packaging, and the packaging of the lens contained some silicone compounds. And after that, the lenses started to calcify. So it seems that if you have contamination of the surface of the lens with silicon compounds or silicon elements, this starts um, calcification. So we tested this for the other lenses, for the memory lens, the SC60BOV, and the AquaSense because we received many in our laboratory. So we performed scanning electron microscopy with the elemental composition. And in all of them, we actually found a higher concentration of silicon where the calcification was. So that was confirmed also to be a factor to initiate calcification for the other lenses. But this is really a multifactorial problem. So you have packages with silicon compounds, but that does not explain everything, because if that was the only factor, all of these lenses would calcify, and that's not the case. So some studies show that if you use certain viscoelastics in combination with those lenses, you have more calcification. Uh, so other studies show that if you have certain diseases with high levels of calcium phosphate, you have more calcifications. Like if you have chronic breakdown of the blood aqueous barrier, like in diabetes, you have more calcification. But each factor alone does not explain everything. So there are some factors nowadays that we still do not really fully understand. But what you really have to know is this. So we published this paper that showed that in the cover of ophthalmology because the patients had memory lenses, they were opacified, and the ophthalmologists could not make the diagnosis of the condition. So they thought, oh, okay, is this is a posterior capsule opacification, let us yag. That's the first thing they do. And actually what happens when they yag is that you have to explain the lens in any way, and it makes the explantation procedure much more complicated. <coughs> then other ophthalmologists said, okay, it's not posterior capsule opacification, there is something in the vitreous, let us do vitrectomy. They did vitrectomy, and later the patient had uh, infection, and ophthalmitis, CME, and this is all because they could not make the diagnosis of calcification of the memory lens, and the treatment is explantation. There, there is no treatment nowadays. How you make the diagnosis? If you do a nice slit lamp examination, you definitely can make the diagnosis. You do not even need anything extra to figure out that. And if you do nicely, you can see where the deposits are, on the surface, anterior surface, within the substance, or on the posterior surface, or on both. So you have to pay attention to that. What it is that we are seeing a lot nowadays, something really interesting, you are probably familiar with the procedures like the MAC and the SAC, where you have, um, so, replacement of part of the cornea, and then when you put the flap, you have to inject air or gas inside of the anterior chamber to keep that flap against the cornea. And after these procedures, if the patient was pseudophagy and the patient actually was implanted with a hydrophilic acrylic lens, we started to observe a very specific form of calcification that is very localized on the anterior surface, subsurface of the lens, just within the capsulorexis area. And it's very characteristic. So I would like to show you some images here. All of these patients had hydrophilic acrylic lenses, and they had like guttata, and then later the surgeon decided to do the MAC or the SAC. And that's how they end up with these deposits. They are very localized in this round area. When you checked, they correspond to the opening of the pupil or of the capsulorexis. 
And also very interesting, in that form of calcification I showed you before with the large numbers, the calcification would show up like two years or more after surgery. Here it may show up like a few weeks after this DMAC procedure. So it's something also very accelerated. So you see all of them are very round, very localized. And we had this lens that was explanted here with uh, the capsule bag. And when you do the staining, you see that the deposits are there within the capsulorexis area. You see the capsulorexis margin right there. And if you check the IOL elsewhere, there is no calcification. It's just right there. And that, if you think, is the area where the IOL surface is in direct contact with the aqueous humor, right? So if you do the von Kosse staining again, you see the calcification localized right there on the anterior surface is not anywhere else. So what happened is that some people said, okay, maybe there is direct contact between this gas and the surface of the lens that's inducing that. I do not really believe so because you see some other cases where you do not see this contact between the air and that specific region uh, for a long time. So I think there is some problem, some metabolic change inside of the aqueous humor, inside of the anterior chamber because you have the air or maybe just because you have these repeated surgeries. Because sometimes you do the MAC and the flap detaches and then you have to regas and put another bubble of air. So you have these repeated procedures and maybe this is causing this specific form of uh, calcification. However, nowadays the, uh, the corneal surgeons already know that if they have a patient coming for cataract surgery, it's a patient that may have some guttata, they may think one day they may require the MAC or the SAC or something, they know that they should not put a hydrophilic acrylic lens because the chance to get this opacified is like 10% or a little bit higher, which is actually a lot. So we had new interesting cases. For example, the Sulcoflex is a supplementary IOL. It's unfortunately not available in this country. It's a very good lens that you can put in the sulcos on top of the lens in the bag if you have a refractive surprise. And that lens is in the market since many years. It never, ever calcified. People start doing the MAC and the SAC, and now we have at least four cases. And that's very interesting, too. This lens is not available here. It's available in Europe. It's a hydrophilic acrylic lens with a hydrophobic coating. The company said, okay, if you put a hydrophobic coating, you are going to prevent the problem of calcification. Sure enough, it did not. We have many, many cases of calcification on these lenses after the SAC and the MAC. And now what's interesting is that we have been receiving a lot of cases where the same pattern of round anterior surface calcification of different hydrophilic acrylic lenses, these are different manufacturers, they occur after any procedure that's a secondary procedure. Sometimes it's intravitreal anti-VGF injection, sometimes it's vitrectomy, retinal detachment surgery, or sometimes it's glaucoma surgery, sometimes you have gas, air, silicone oil, sometimes you do not have any of those and it's still you see this specific pattern of calcification. That's why I think it's not a problem of the substance being introduced in the anterior chamber, but it is a problem of repeated procedure. Okay, silicone lenses. What are the problems that we may see with silicone lenses? We had toxic anterior segment syndrome, is this exaggerated inflammation that occur, may occur after cataract surgery, related to silicone lenses and an oily substance floating on, um, in the anterior chamber. And in all of the cases, you had silicone lenses implanted via clear cornea incisions, and the surgeon would use ointment at the end of the surgery and put an eye patch. So basically, you can see that these were very serious problems because it required um, secondary procedures like even penetrating keratoplasty. And we analyzed all of these, the corneas that have to, re to be removed, the IOLs, and the oil inside of the anterior chamber um, of the patients. And here you see how the lens was covered by this oily material. And with different analysis, like gas chromatography, mass spectrum, spectroscopy, you can identify the solutions like the CSI on TV. So basically turn the 
turn out that these were the ointments that you're using after cataract surgery. So he was applying the ointment a very tight eye patch. The incision would gape after surgery, and the ointment was entering inside. And the vehicle of this ointment, the base of this ointment, is extremely toxic to the corneal endothelium. So nowadays, uh, there is a trend to not use ointments after surgery, but drops because of this problem. If you have a patient with a potential retinal problem that one day may potentially require silicone oil, you should not implant a silicone lens in that patient because there is an interaction between the silicone material and the silicone oil that's irreversible and you may, may have a lens covered like that and you would one day have to explant these silicone lenses. So in retina patients, you have to select your IOL accordingly. So you probably all know by now what's asteroid hyalosis. So basically you have inside of the vitreous these bodies, very bright, and basically they are composed of calcium and phosphate. So in these eyes, if you have a silicone lens, that silicone lens actually may calcify. That's the only issue related to calcification of other lenses other than what I described to you with the hydrophilic acrylic lenses. It is very interesting, we described this first with very early generation silicone lenses, and then with the AG laser, you actually can dust those deposits out of the surface of the silicone lens. It only happens on the posterior surface that's more in contact with that material. And with the hydrophilic acrylic lens, if you use the YAG to dust off the, the deposits, you cannot do that. But in the silicone, you can. However, you have a vitreous full of calcified deposits, so that it starts to calcify again. So you ultimately have to explant the silicone lens. So you see very typical, only on the posterior surface, you can clean with the AG laser, but it starts to opacify again. This is an interesting case because you had a bilateral asteroid hyalosis. The other eye had a hydrophobic acrylic lens. That lens never calcified, just the silicone. You have a question? You have an intact posterior capsule. Yeah. Yes, and that's very interesting because you have, in, in many of the cases we had, and first of all, we check the literature, there is a permeability of the posterior capsule according to the size of the molecule, and those could go through. And in many of the cases we had, the capsule was actually intact, and then the surgeon would look, the ophthalmology would look, oh, okay, it's PCO, right? You yag immediately. And then you yag, and you still see these deposits there. And then it gets worse because the vitreous now is in contact with the posterior surface. So in many cases, when um, they woke up for the problem, the posterior capsule was initially actually intact. Yeah, always on the posterior surface. So again, the other eye of this patient had a hydrophobic acrylic lens, the same asteroid hyalosis never calcified. And then we thought maybe it's just the old generation silicone lenses. Now with the new generation, that doesn't happen. But sure enough, we had cases with all kind of silicone lenses. You can see here the different refractive index indicate each one of these lenses a different silicone material, and they calcify in asteroids hyalosis. So you have to be aware of that. And we tested with the hydrophilic acrylic lenses. We have hundreds explanted. We checked if those patients eventually had asteroid hyalosis, but there was none. So it has nothing to do with that problem. It is definitely a different problem. In the absence of asteroid hyalosis, the silicone lens does not calcify. We had these very interesting cases from Brazil of the lenses turning white the day after the surgery. It was very interesting. They sent to me liquid. I was checking them, and as they were drying, the opacification disappeared. And the same thing you see here under light microscopy. So as they dry, the opacification disappears. If you put in solution, it starts again. So we analyzed them with many things, and it turns out that they were contaminated with these molecules. They are present in fumigants or industrial cleaning agents, which should never be there because this is not part of the IOL manufacture. So what happens here was very interesting. These lenses were sent by four of my colleagues in Brazil from different areas, but before they were implanted, they were all stored in one single place where uh, there was fumigation for cockroaches. 
So you cannot forget the IOLs may be packaged, the majority of them, in these semi-permeable packages to allow sterilization by vapor. So if vapor for sterilization enters the IOL, you, you may have other chemicals in vapor that may contaminate the IOL, and that's exactly what happened. So after these studies, uh, it was very clear that you have to pay attention to the conditions of storage of IOL. And because of that publication, actually, many companies changed the packaging, putting extra plastic outside, because uh, this, is, this was actually a real problem. It was a very interesting study. OK, hydrophobic acrylic lenses. What's the main issue? Glistenings and also subsurface nanoglistenings. It got even worse. OK, what are glistenings? I have a major review with 20 pages if you want to read before bed. So, but basically, you have fluid-filled microvacuoles within the IOL when they are in an aqueous environment. They may be, in general, up to 20 microns. They are mostly described with hydrophobic acrylic lenses. You actually may see them with any lens, but it's really an issue with a hydrophobic acrylic lens. Not all hydrophobic acrylic lenses are the same. There is one specific material that's more problematic for that. They may show up as early as one week after surgery. And with the Acrisoft lens by Alcon, if you really pay attention to slit lamp, you always see it, even in small amounts, but you always see it. Just to show you that they may happen with other materials. You have other lenses here with glistenings, but it's usually not an issue with other materials. Incidence, if, if you, again, if you check an Acrisoft lens, I believe you see glistenings in 100% of the cases, even if in very small amounts, you always see it. They will look like these bright spots there. So some studies suggest that after some time, the frequency, the size, the density, they stabilize. But you have an initial period of two, three years where they may keep growing. So there are many classifications in the literature, uh, ways that you check them on this lit lamp and score the amount of glistenings, or you get an image from a, uh, from a slit lamp, put in a computer, and calculate the number of glistenings in a volume of the lens. There are many ways to grade that. Why they form? What you have to know that is um, when you have an IOL, the polymer of that IOL is complicated. So you have all the polymers, different components, you have the UV absorbers, you have cross-linking agents. There are many things I didn't tell you, actually. I just simplified. But all these molecules are very complex. So you have microvoids within the polymer network. And then any polymer that you put inside of water will absorb water, even the hydrophobic ones. And that absorption rate is going to increase with increase in temperature. So. If that temperature goes above the glass transi transition temperature, that's the temperature where the mat material becomes flexible. If it goes, uh, the temperature is rising, that water absorption is just increasing. So here you have the water absorption curve for the Acrisoft material. So the water is there inside of polymer, but you do not see it. It is within a vapor form. So let us say that lens is in a warm water, is in equilibrium, and suddenly the temperature of the environment is lowered. So what's happening is that you have an excess water inside of that polymer, and suddenly it detaches from the vapor form and is going to gather inside of these microvoids of the polymer. So you suddenly have the microvoids filled with water. The water refractive index is 1.33. The, water, the refractive index of the IOL material is always higher than that. So then when you shine light, you are going to have light refracted, scattered at those interfaces. And that's why you see this glistening as this briny, bright, bright, shiny thing. So that's what it is. Mm -hmm. So if the, if the IOL then reheats, will it go back into vapor form? Once they form, they continue. Once they form, they definitely continue, and then it keeps increasing. So next time you have a, a change in temperature, they will keep increasing. So, and uh, some studies show that you just need a change of three degrees Celsius to initiate glistenings in the Acrisoft material. So that's a real thing. And then with the Acrisoft material, there are some different packagings, and there was an early packaging that was this up here that would make this process somehow even worse. 
when you check the hydrophobic acrylic lenses, they are made in different types of procedures like molding versus late cutting and one procedure would be worse than the other for the glistening formation. If the patient had diabetes, glaucoma, it seems that that will make glistening formation also worse. But here is just, it's very complicated, just to show you some of the hydrophobic acrylic materials in the market. Each one of them has a different tendency to glistening formation. The most problematic one is really the Acrisoft material. It's the one that mostly people noted under slit lamp that there is something going on in the optic. So again, I want to highlight the fact that there are new materials with a higher water content. They are still hydrophobic acrylic, but because they have this water equilibrium, they do not form glistenings. So the uh, temperature imbalance in those materials does not influence anything. Because they are already in equilibrium with a higher water content, they are glistening free. So uh, this was the first material, the Invista, but nowadays in Europe you have at least two more. And Alcon is uh, already launched in, the, uh, in Europe during the last ESRS, a new lens named Clarion. You may be seeing this soon. So Clarion is a hydrophobic acrylic lens made by Alcon with a slightly higher water content and it seems to be glistening free too. I don't know if they will continue with the Acrisoft or not, but in, in the near future you may be seeing a shift there. Because the Acrisoft is still the most implanted lens in the world. So they may discontinue that and start with the Clarion. I don't know exactly the plan, but they address that. So, does this have an effect on vision function? It really depends on who you are asking the question. So, I reviewed the literature and some studies you, you see that even if you induce exaggerated amount of glistenings, they would not impact vision function. Uh, some studies show that they do impact contrast sensitivity, even visual acuity. Many studies will clearly say that they do not. It's a very controversial matter. But in any way, there is a potential, at least, for impacting the visual function. But in some studies, I mean, like this case that I published, you have some exaggerated amounts of glistening. So these are not only a lot, they were huge. And actually, this patient had a retinal issue, so he was not complaining of decreasing visual acuity, but the ophthalmologist could not do a nice retinal examination of this patient because of the glistenings in this Acrisoft. So I got this lens and I put in water and compared with the control. So you put in water and you change the temperature. That's how you form glistening in the lab. It's very easy. And this is what you get with the control, 20 microns. This here is like 200, 300 microns. So that was a total aberration. I never saw this, but it was definitely exaggerated. But now the Acrisoft material has another problem that's called subsurface nanoglistenings. And what it is that? This is a lens that was explanted from a cadaver eye. This is a control, both Acrisoft lenses. Inside of water, the light is coming from above. They are exactly in the same position. Here, the only thing I changed to take this photograph is that the light is now coming from both sides. And you see that one is totally white and the other one is not. So what is that? This is done by the subsurface nanoglycinase. So the glistenings are here inside of the optic of the lens, vacuoles filled with fluid. The subsurface nanoglycenes are just very small molecules on the subsurface of the lens. This is also an issue with the Acrisoft material. It happens with other lenses, but not up to this extent. When you do shine fluke photography, you can see this and actually measure the brightness of that, so you can actually quantify that. So that's that lens, that's the control, you barely see the IOL. And we did many studies to try to show what's the impact of the subsurface nanoglycinings on the visual function of the patient. We measure light scattering, light transmittance, and we can see that they grow with time. Some clinical studies show that the Acrosoft lens may have increasing rates of subsurface nanoglycinings up to 10 years. So that is really complicated. So that's an Acrisoft lens, again, a single piece. And here you have the shine fluke photography of that lens with a lot of light scattering. And here's the control. So even though you have a lot of backlight scattering, 
when you measure the light transmission between these two lenses, they are just the same. This is just to say that if you consider subsurface nanoglycines alone, even very high levels are not likely to impact the visual function. However, the problem is that if you have an acrosoft lens, you may have both issues. You may have glistenings and subsurface nanoglycines, and that gets complicated. So this is a single piece lens without the blue blocker. And again, the same thing, a lot of backlight scattering, but the light transmission was pretty much the same. Hmm? I think the first subsurface nanoglycine, does that eventually uh, progress into the glycines themselves? Do they kind of transition or do they just No, stay they may stay. Uh, separate issues, they may start uh, simultaneously with time, you start both uh, growing, you may have lenses with one or the other uh, more prominent feature, so it doesn't seem they are completely dependent. They, the uh, subsurface nanoglycine do not depend on change in temperature also. It seems to be a characteristic of the surface of the lens. So why I'm talking about that is very interesting because when you are doing slit lamp of these patients, you know how you can change the angle of the light, right? And I don't know how many mails I get from surgeons all around the world, ophthalmologists saying, okay, I have an acrosoft lens, it's hydrophobic acrylic, I am sure it's calcified. And then I tell them, okay, read this paper because I am sure it's not. Because what happens is that if you put the light in an angle, this becomes so white that it almost really look like a calcification. And then you get all these people panicking, I have this hydrophobic acrylic lens, you told me you never calcify and I'm sure it's calcified. And sure enough, it's not. So as there are so many hydrophobic acrylic lenses in the market here, especially Acrisol, you have to be aware of that because one day you may be on this little lamp and you angle your light just right and you're going to see this white thing and you are going to be really surprised. But usually the patient is not <coughs> complaining much, which is very interesting because it looks absolutely horrible. Okay, so and then the next class of material we're going to discuss is the PMMA rigid lenses, the snowflake degeneration. That used to happen with old PMMA lenses manufactured in the 80s or 90s by injection molding. It does not really happen with modern lenses. I mean, I really could not trace back any modern lenses. Everything I could, we could receive here and analyze, we trace back to this era and to this procedure. So uh, it's very gradual. Sometimes it takes 10 to 20 years to be really opacified. And then at that point, you really have an issue with the vision function. And for example, here. So once in a while, believe me or not, we still receive things like that. And what's interesting is that you are noticing that there is no lesion in the periphery of the optics, mostly the center, right? Because the periphery of the optic is covered by the iris, and it's always like that. So Dr. Apple named snowflake because the, the individual lesion may look like a snowflake. So the explantation of this is not always necessary because it may take 20 years for this to be visually significant, but it's good if you check that, you see the difference with glistenings because the uh, fluid field uh, vacuoles are very, very different. So what is that? By, at that time, with that type of procedure of manufacture, they had to use a molecule to initiate polymerization. And in some cases, there was an excess of this molecule and with time, in that region of the optic, you have UV light that is coming through. The periphery is usually protected by the iris. And what you had is liberation of gas inside of the IOL, and it was like cracking the IOL. So what, what you see is actually cracking inside of the optic. And again, it's sparing the periphery of the lens. So uh, you have to make a difference because even in dry state, you see the snowflakes. If you dry an IOL with glistenings, you do not see any glistenings because it's all based on the water thing. However, in these areas where you have snowflake cracks, snowflake lesions, you have excess water that may be accumulated there, making it clinically significant. So again, what we learned here is that there are different IOL materials and there are different factors that may be sometimes related to the patient, like you have a DMAC procedure, IOL manufacture, you have these excess molecules inducing polymerization. 
the IOL storage, you remember the case in Brazil with the fumigation, adjuvants, this, you know, think that with some viscoelastics you may have more calcification than others. There are many factors that may be involved in a process of opacification of intraocular lens. This opacification may be observed fast after surgery or many, many years after surgery. So for some complications, you also have not only the influence of the material, but sometimes of the design. I did not have time to show here, but if you have an IOL that's specifically made for the capsular bag, like the single piece lenses, if you put that lens in the sulcus, you have a whole new uh, uh, series of complications because that design is not adapted for that site. But we focus today on the complications of the materials. So because every year in the market, there are so many new IOLs, we have to be always vigilant. And there are many new materials coming up, especially with this new thinking that you can have hydrophobic acrylic materials with higher water content to be glistenings free. There's a huge number of new materials coming up and we have to pay attention because maybe in a few years we are going to be seeing complications that we never saw before. And we have the privilege to receive in the lab these lenses that are explanted from all over the world and sometimes we are really surprised with what we see, but it's always very interesting. Thank you very much. Any other question? Did I answer your question about the glistenings? Yeah, mm -hmm. I do have another question. Sure. Um, so with the TAS um, and putting the ointment on the eye, if you put, uh, uh, say, glue on the clear-cut area, will that allow, still allow for ointment? To that is a very good question because um, it depends on your incision, if it's going to gape or not. But if you put the glue and you prevent that, I would assume not. But I think the easier thing is really to avoid ointment, which I think in this country is not that common. Common. That was all from Canada. It was very interesting from different sides, but it seems that there at that time, it was almost like a standard of operation procedures to finalize the cataract surgery, put ointment and the tie tie patch and it came from different sites in Canada. They changed because of the, this problem. So I don't think it's very common here. I don't think here is the Moran, nobody, we use in our rabbits, by the way, but yeah. I don't think you use in your patients, so. But it's a real problem. The component, the base component of this ointment is extremely toxic for the endothelium. The majority of the cases require corneal grafts. Okay, so now, you have just to take home message. And I think in your tests you have these questions. Hydrophilic acrylic lenses, what's the most important issue? Calcification, hydrophobic acrylic, glistenings, PMMA, snowflake degeneration. Can a silicone lens calcify? Yes, in eyes with asteroid hyaluxes. I think those are part of some questions you have in your tests. So keep that in mind. Thank you. It seems I will see you tomorrow.